Okay, uh, hello and welcome to this um, yeah, special uh, seminar of the QIS um, virtual seminar series. Um, today we have uh, Giulio Ciribella talking about quantum operations with indefinite time directions. And um, just to give a bit of context, um, we aim to continue this type of uh, seminar series out of the standard time schedule that is more suitable for uh, Europe and, and uh, US. We, we want to have also more of the seminars just as the, the current one that uh, is also more suitable to people in Asia and Oceania. And um, with this, the stage is all yours, Julio. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, well, thank you, Lucas, and uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thanks to the organizers of the KISS seminars, Lucas, Pierre, Marius. Uh, so it's great to give this talk um, for two reasons. The first one is that this is a topic that is very dear to my heart. So it's been um, kind of the, the idea that excited me the most, uh, uh, at least in my own research in the past year. And second, because this idea is kind of heavily influenced by discussion and ideas that we had within the KISS collaboration. And so it's kind of great to, to, to present it in a KISS seminar. Uh, so let me get started. So I will try to aim to, to finish in, in about 30 minutes so that we have more time for the discussion. Although please allow me to spill by a few minutes in case I need it, but, but the, the aim is to, to stay within that time. So, um, and feel free to ask questions if you need clarifications during the talk and leave maybe more open-ended questions to, to the end. Okay, so uh, what is the talk about? Uh, it's about uh, time symmetry and things that we can do in a time symmetric world. Um, there is a general consensus that at the fundamental level, the dynamics of elementary particles and fields is time symmetric. Uh, this is a property of the equation of motions, uh, either of the non-relativistic ones like Schrodinger equation or of the relativistic equations like the field equations. So we know that uh, in all these cases, inverting the direction of time in the equations of motion kind of doesn't alter the form of these equations. So if we do all the changes we have to do, eventually the form of the equations remains invariant, which suggests that nature is kind of indifferent to the direction of time at the fundamental level. On the other hand, something that is equally obvious is that our own experimental capabilities are not time symmetric. Uh, all the experiments we know are, are experiments where um, the agent, the remainder, would uh, initialize the state of the system at cert a certain moment in time, will let evolve the system in the forward time direction, and eventually we'll do measurements in, in the future or after, after this evolution. So there is a, an asymmetry here between the ability to force the preparation of a system. So we assume that we can, in principle, initialize a quantum system in any state we like. Whereas there is an asymmetry between this and the ability to choose the outcome of an experiment, which we don't have. I mean, we can pre-select the state of the system but normally we don't believe we can post-select the state of the system. The, the state of the system, I mean, we can, but we cannot deterministically force one outcome. So this is an obvious asymmetry in all the experiments that, that we know of. And um, yes, yeah, so, so we will have, um, we, can, we, we can deterministically pre-select the state of the system, but we cannot deterministically post-select. And now, why there is this time asymmetry between the fundamental equations of motion and the practical effective abilities that we have as experimenters? Well, this is a long-standing question. There have been many, many discussions on this point, different hypotheses. Maybe the most popular is the idea that the universe started in a low entropy initial state and therefore the entropy can only increase after that. Um, this is one, probably a popular explanation, maybe not the only one. There is a long history to this type of questions and I, I will not enter into that. Uh, the point I want to make is that in general, there is a consensus that for one reason or another, um, the fundamental physics is time symmetric and uh, the time asymmetry is an artifact of our own position as agents. The, the way like our place in, a, in the world make us think that the world is, look, see the world in a time asymmetric way, although uh, this is not part of the fundamental equation of motion. 
So as I said, this is a problem with a long standing history, but there is a kind of a, a recent coming back of these ideas uh, within uh, this collaboration, within the KISS collaboration. I think for me, this all started with a talk that uh, Carlo Rovelli gave uh, at the first quick, uh, KISS workshop uh, we had here at HKU. And well, here is the link, is, uh, is, is, is the first talk of the workshop when we started point, making this point to say, in quantum gravity, we don't care about the direction of time, whereas you guys in quantum information always talk about uh, processes that are time asymmetric. So how do we reconcile these two approaches and can we learn something from this? There has been a stream of work that uh, followed from this kind of momentum, uh, the, an influential work by Di Biagio, Donna and Rovelli. Then there was a, a work by Lucien Hardy that is in this archive paper and one by myself, uh, Eric Aurel and Karol Zikowski on like the notion of symmetry and time symmetry in quantum mechanics so that is here. All right. So one thing that you can ask, if you believe that the fundamental evolution is actually time symmetric, if it is really true that nature doesn't care about the direction of time, we could at least in principle imagine another type of agents, not like ourselves, another type of agents that would be able to act in the opposite time direction. These agents may or may not exist, but it's kind of interesting to look at the theoretical possibility that they may exist and to try to understand how these things would work from that point of view. Because no matter whether exist, they exist or not, this kind of reasoning can, uh, can reveal some properties about, um, about time symmetry and, and time as asymmetric aspects in quantum theory. So what would be a backward facing agent? This would be an agent that uh, would be able to, to initialize the state of a system at a certain moment of time let it evolve backward in time and then doing measurements at an earlier moment of time. So an agent that has exactly the opposite uh, use of the time direction. At least theoretically, we can imagine these agents because at least the, the framework of unitary quantum mechanics allows us to, 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 to entertain this idea. So now there are two key questions one can ask. The first is like, uh, okay, which physical processes allow for such a dual description. So which boxes, if you see my blue box in this picture, which blue box between one time t and another time t prime could be used both in the normal forward direction and in the, in the exotic backward direction. So presumably not, not all processes have this feature, like which ones do have this feature? That's a very important question here. Uh, the second question that is related is, um, how would you translate, if your process, if this uh, blue box that I have here allows this dual use, can be used both in the forward and in the, in the backward direction, then how would you translate from the description of the process of the forward agent, from our point of view, to the point of view of this backward agent that uses the device in the exotic way from the future to the past? So these are the two key questions one may ask about uh, forward and backward processes. Now, after you think about these questions, you can even become more ambitious and try to do something even more exotic than thinking about agents that act in the opposite direction of time. Because we are all used to quantum theory where we have the superposition principle and whatever classical alternatives in principle can be put inside cats and superposed. You could ask something about uh, um, some exotic agents that would be bidirectional, that is, um, let's say, either preparing a state in the future and observing the evolution in, sorry, either preparing a state in the past and observing the evolution in the forward direction, or preparing a state in the future and observing the direction in the, in the, the evolution in the backward direction. And these two scenarios could be in a quantum superposition. So there could be an exotic, a, exotic agent that probes the same physical process in a sort of superposition of the forward and the backward direction. At least kind of as a metaphor, we can think of, of, of an agent like that. Of course, what it really means mathematically and how do you describe a process like this is not at all clear a priori. And this is, I would say, the main question of this talk. So the, the, the third question, my list of key questions would be like, how do we even describe an operation like this, the action of an agent that is in a superposition of being in the past and being in the future and in a superposition of 
probing a process in the forward and in the backward time direction. So how do we even describe this mathematically? Uh, assuming that we can answer this question, the next uh, question in line would be, okay, if an agent has this exotic ability, what can he do, he or she do with this? What can an agent do with the ability to probe a physical process in a superposition of time directions? So these are the key questions that motivated our work. And uh, well, time permitting, I will give some answers to, to all of them during the talk. Okay, so let's now enter a little bit more deeply into the problem and then into the technical details. Now, first of all, how do you even describe uh, operations done by agents that are not the usual ones that you are familiar with? So there is a framework that allows you to define mathematically in a precise way what is an operation that uh, an agent can do uh, in a, with indefinite time direction, with indefinite time order, or with strange structures? So this framework is called the framework of quantum supermaps, which may sound a bit of a, a, a scary technical name, but actually it's a very simple idea. A, a supermap describes an operation that you can do on a set of processes in a way that is compatible with the rules of quantum, with, with the probabilistic structure of quantum theory. In other, way, in, in other words, so this would be the operations that in principle you could do on, 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 on the processes, on the devices that you have, that would not lead you into contradictions, all right? So here there is an example of a, an easy example of a supermap. So there are these four processes with the, the, the arrows telling us what is the past and what is the future. You could have process C, D, and E, and you could wire them together. You can imagine that these are boxes that describe devices you have in a lab. You could take the output of process C, of this green box, and stick it into the input of process D and then take the output of one of the outputs of wires of uh, process D and stick into the input of process E. So wiring is a particular way of using these three processes. And this is a, a simple example of a quantum supermap. It's a valid way to, to, to use these devices that wouldn't give any contradiction, it wouldn't give you negative probabilities or probabilities larger than one. That's basically the requirement. Um, okay, so here there are a few works that introduced the supermaps uh, in the case of definite causal order and also in the case of indefinite causal order. So you can have a, a broad set of supermaps. Um, but let's see what has been done so far with this framework. So the first thing that was done was to use supermaps to describe things you can do in a definite order, like wiring processes together according to a well-defined causal order. Uh, this framework is also sometimes called the framework of quantum comps. So in this picture here, you have these uh, four uh, uh, red or pinkish boxes. And the way you can combine them is simply to plug them into these green circuits. So to put them between a sequence of quantum gates uh, ordered from the past to the future in a, in a very standard way. Now, a more exotic type of supermap that was considered later was the one of supermaps with the indefinite causal order. Uh, a simple example of this is called the quantum switch, where you have two processes F and G, and you create a superposition of using F before G or G before F. So the choice of the order is controlled by a quantum bit that is like a bit like uh, in the Schrodinger cut experiment. This would be like the state of the radio radioactive particle that would decide whether the cat is alive or dead. Here, this cube, this, this bit, this quantum bit decides whether F is before G or the other way around. And another type of uh, process within definite causal order were this process matrix, matrix and other example of process matrices introduced by Oreshkov, Costa, and Bruckner. So this is different from the quantum switch, but still, these are super maps with indefinite causal order. Now, the key point is that all these super maps studied so far may have indefinite causal order, but they always have a definite time direction. So that's an important point that I want to make. So the difference between indefinite causal order and between indefinite time direction is easy to make this point with the quantum switch. So let's see this picture. There is the switch of two, two processes, C1 and C2. You can see two paths. There is the blue path where that goes through C1 first and then through C2. 
and the orange path that goes through C2 first and then through C1. So the quantum switch creates a quantum superposition, a coherent superposition of these two scenarios. But in both cases, you see that uh, we enter in the device C1 from the, from, the, from the left to the right, and also in the device C2 from the left to the right. So if you think that uh, left to right here would be one time, earlier time and later time, in the switch we are using both processes always from the past to the future. We are never using them from the future to the past. They are always used in the for locally in the forward time direction. So the take home message is that the relative order between C1 and C2 is in a superposition, but the time direction locally between C1 and within C2 is always uh, well-defined and is always the forward one. So why nobody has considered the supermaps with indefinite time direction before? Um, why all these supermaps have a definite time direction? Well, there is a clear reason why this is the case is that um, all the maps that uh, we considered in the past were defined to, on the full set of quantum channels. Mathematically, a quantum channel is a trace-preserving, completely positive linear map. So if you consider this set of mathematical maps and you define supermaps on them, uh, you only get supermaps with a definite time direction because the, the asymmetry that you have for the set of quantum channels propagates to the set of things you can do on the channels, to the super maps you can do. So here is kind of the intuitive picture for why a channel is a, is a time asymmetric object. A quantum channel in general can be always realized by taking your system, your input system, and some, some other system serving as the environment so you would initialize the environment in a certain state, let it evolve unitarily together with the system, and eventually discard the environment. So this is the open system picture of, of a quantum evolution. Now, if you do that, you can realize every possible channel in this way. And you can see that this particular realization has a very clear time asymmetry because you pre-select the state of the environment in the past and you post-discard the state of the environment in the future. So you throw away in the, away in the future and you initialize the environment in the past. So that, this is an asymmetric type of realization. And morally, or at least intuitively, this gives you the right intuition. So this, this brings a time asymmetry in. Now, there are these works that have been done recently, well, basically all in the past year, that go a bit more deeply and explain more, like explain the deeper reason why the set of channels is time asymmetric. So there is much more to say about the time asymmetry of quantum channels than just this picture that I'm showing here. So if you are interested, please look into the papers because they say much more than what is here, but I will not go deeper into this in the talk, uh, at least in the slides. Okay, the only point I wanted to make is that uh, quantum channels are time asymmetric objects. And as such, uh, they induce the time asymmetry also on the operations you can do on them. So all the operations you can get by acting on channels are super maps that have a definite time direction inside them. Oh, funny to see that somebody now is calling me. Let me see if I can turn off the phone. All right. Um, okay, good. So the point of this talk is to go beyond uh, this, this situation. And if you want to do that, we have to forget about defining supermaps on all possible quantum channels. You need to consider a, a subset of the set of all quantum channels that has a time symmetry. So it only makes sense to talk about operations with indefinite time direction if you first define a set of processes that is time symmetric. And now the point of this talk is to, to go through these points. So to tell you, what is the largest set of time symmetric channels you can define compatibly with four requirements that I will tell you in a, in a couple of slides. Then I will give you a framework for operations with indefinite time direction, and I will give you an example. So now I will try to go fast so that we can cover at least superficially all these topics and then leave time to go more deeply into the discussion. So the first part is about uh, talking about what are the, the time symmetric processes? What are the bidirectional processes? So here is the idea. Let's fix uh, like the framework or what we really are trying to understand. 
So we'll call a bidirectional process a physical process that in principle can be probed both in the forward direction and in the backward direction. So we have here our two agents. There is the forward agent are acting in the forward time direction. There is the backward agent acting in the opposite time direction. And there is the same device, the same physical process in between that can be used in two possible ways, either by preparing an input in the past and seeing what happens and looking what happens in the future, or by preparing the input in the future and looking what happens in the past. These are two complementary ways to use the same process. And uh, presumably there is a set of processes with this property and we want to know which processes have this property. So I will call the description of the forward agent, uh, the, the forward agents will describe this process as a quantum channel C, a normal quantum channel, a completely positive trace preserving linear map. Now, from the backward agent, I will assume that also the process will look as a completely positive trace preserving map, a normal quantum channel, except that, that this channel will be different because that's kind of another way of using the device. So I will call this uh, new channel big data of C, where big data is the change of description from the forward agent to the backward agent. I will call this big data a time reversal. So it's important that we make this use of the word clear because time reversal is a very heavily loaded term. Everybody has their favorite definition. So what I'm doing here is that I use a very precise definition, this one. So for me, time reversal is the change of description from the description of the forward agent to the description of a hypothetical backward agent. Okay. Um, now, since we don't know much about backward agents, we don't know really how the world should look to them. What, I did, what we did here was to have um, some axioms, so some properties that we, looked, uh, that we thought to be reasonable to ask about this change of description between the forward and the backward agent. So axiom one, I think is the most fundamental of all, is that the time reversal should invert the order of processes. So if you have process C1 after process C2 in the forward direction, for the backward agent, the order should appear the opposite. It should be the, the time reversal of C2 after the time reversal of C1. And this is really what happens if you draw these two processes on a line and you look at the picture from the two possible directions. The second axiom is kind of the second requirement is more physically motivated. I mean, at the beginning of the talk, I, to I told about um, the fundamental dynamics of particles and fields. So this is the unitary dynamics. So it's natural to require that every unitary uh, operation, every unitary dynamics admits a time reversal and that the time reversal of a unitary dynamics is also a unitary dynamics. This is kind of physically motivated. That, that was the whole starting point of, of the whole discussion. The third axiom is that uh, if you have a random mixture of two processes from the point of view in, in the forward direction, if you, take a, if you change the description to the backward direction, what we should have is the random mixture of the time reversals with the same probabilities. So if we, if, if we have some, device, some property of the device that is chosen at random, then this randomness propagates uh, uh, to, the, to the translation in backward and forward direction. Finally, the time reversal should be a sort of a symmetry, a sort of symmetry. So what I mean is that if two processes look different from the point of view of the forward agent, it's natural to require that they will look different also from the point of view of the backward agent. So that pretty much, uh, the distinguishability of processes still remains, is, is still remains under change of description. So these are the four requirements that we imposed on this change of description from the forward to the backward agent. Um, and you should notice that this time reversal is only defined on the, on the time symmetric processes. So we have a double problem. We have to, to characterize what are the time symmetric bidirectional processes and what are the possible time reversals. So this is the, the thing that we did. So the first key results are this. Uh, I just split it first into a result for unitary processes and then into a result for general quantum channels. So the result is this. So if you have um, a unitary process, up to unitary equivalence, up to changes of basis, there are only two possible time reversals, only two possible changes of descriptions that satisfy the axioms. In fact, only axioms one and four are necessary here. 
So either you have the adjoint, so you, the, you change the description of U into U dagger, the matrix U becomes the matrix U dagger, or you have the transpose. The matrix U becomes the matrix U transpose. That's all, up to changes of basis. So these are the only possible time reversals of unitaries. Now, a little bit uh, more of a complex result is uh, for general irreversible processes or general uh, quantum channels, there are only two possible time reversals. Uh, one is to map uh, the channel into the dagger of the channel. So these channels have the Krauss representation. You can write them in operators. You just change each operator into its dagger. So you get this dagger of the channel. Or you could have the transpose where you change each operator into the, into the, into the, into the transpose. And this gives you the transpose of the channel. So the theorem is that uh, up to changes of basis, up to some fixed unitary that you can put everywhere, uh, these are the only possibilities. There is nothing else than this. Uh, the other thing that you can do is to characterize the possible changes of description. So the possible, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the, the, po the, the possible uh, bidirectional processes. So the theorem is that the largest set of processes that are um, bidirectional according to these axioms is the set of uh, bistochastic quantum channels. So channels that can be written in this Krauss decomposition where the channel is sum over i, ci, rho ci dagger with the, these two conditions. So the sum over i, ci dagger, ci should be equal to the identity matrix and the sum over i of ci, ci dagger should also be equal to the identity matrix. So not every channel satisfies both equations and the ones that do are called the bistochastic channels. So they are the broadest set of possible uh, bidirectional processes you can consider compatibly with these four requirements. All right, so this concluded the part one. Now, the second part is kind of quicker and shorter to describe. So now that we know how the change of description is between the forward and the backward time direction, we can start playing with it and describe uh, the possible things that agents can do. So what is, would be a super map acting on the bistochastic channel? This must be a linear map for reason that I will not explain now, but it should be a linear map that maps uh, bistochastic channels into in general ordinary channels. So as in this picture, the super map S maps uh, a, an input channel C into an output channel C prime. This is the thing you do on the process. And this, uh, this map should act in a valid way, even if you ap apply it on a part on, of a bipartite channel, of a channel that acts uh, on a composite system. So if this process C acts on a composite system and you touch only one part of the systems where the process acts, you still should have um, a valid uh, output channel. So that's the, the philosophy of what a supermap is. And so we just now want a supermap that is defined not on every possible input channel, but only on those that are bidirectional, which means bistochastic. Uh, here are two important examples. There are the normal supermaps, the forward ones, where you have your device, your initial process C, and you just stick it in a circuit between one operation you do before it, and an operation you do after it. So this is what we can do in our normal uh, forward time direction. One could do a similar thing for a backward agent. So the backward agent would have access to the channel theta of C instead of channel C. Other than that, the backward agent would do the same, would do some operation A prime before using the box, would then use the box and then do some other operation B prime after that. So this can be done when this time reversal is unitarily equivalent to the transpose. And if you want to know why, we, will, we can talk about this later. So these are two examples. Now the crucial definition, the crucial definition that defines what I have, what we, the title of the talk is that a super map that you can define on bistochastic channels has indefinite time direction if you cannot write it as a random mixture of a forward super map and the backward super map. So, if this is not the case, you cannot interpret your, your operation as an operation that you do with some probability by acting in the forward direction and some probability by acting in the backward direction. This would be a super map that is genuinely 
in a kind of quantum superposition or in a kind of indefinite time direction. You cannot break it down as a random mixture of operations you do either in one direction, the forward one, or in the backward one. This definition mirrors exactly a definition of operations with indefinite causal orders that came um, originally from this work by Oreshkov, Costa, and Bruckner, and then was developed in other works. So these operations are sometimes called also causally inseparable. So what we're doing here is the exact analog of this, but now for the time direction instead of the relative orders between two processes. All right, uh, so this concludes part two. And, uh, and brings me to the last part, to part three, that is just one example, a concrete example uh, of a supermap with indefinite time direction. And this is what we call the, the quantum time flip. Now, what is the idea? Very quickly. So the idea is that, um, well, if you can think of a situation where an agent acts in the forward direction, and you can also think of an agent where, a situation where the agent acts in the backward direction, Formally, nobody stops in quantum mechanics by writing, from writing the sum of two cats and calling this the superposition of operations in, in a superposition of time direction. So you can always do that. Um, and this actually has been done. There is this work by uh, Rubino, Manson, and Bruckner that considered the superposition of processes in the forward and backward direction. There was a key talk uh, about a year ago on this, and you can find the link here if you want to see it. But now that's a bit uh, not as much, it's not exactly what we want to do here because we want to do something more than just writing a, a superposition of two scenarios. We would like to define an operation that describes how the agent would do that. And this is not always possible when you write these cats. You, there are some conditions that you need to satisfy in order to define operations with the, with the indefinite time directions. And as you know, we need our, the process, this blue box here, to be a bistochastic channel. We cannot just define this for every possible channel. So there are some conditions that needs to be satisfied, and this is what I'm going to discuss now. So first of all, what, what is mathematically a superposition of uh, using a box in the forward and in the backward direction? Mathematically, it is this. So you pick across the composition of the channel. You pick some operators that represent the channel. And you build some new operators of a new process that acts on the target system and on a qubit, on a quantum bit that controls the direction in which you use the device. So the qubit can be either in the state zero or the state cat zero or the state cat one. And depending on the state of the qubit, you will either use the initial process in the forward way, so with the Krauss operator CI, or in the backward way, so with Krauss operators theta of CI. This would be like the time reversal applied to CI. So this theta of CI is either the dagger or the adjoint, uh, sorry, either the dagger or the transpose. Uh, and uh, so you can define this. Now, with these operators FI, you can define a new process. You define a new map, a new transformation of states of the target and the control qubit together. So you can write down this map, sum over i, fi, rho, fi dagger. And you can ask, when is this map a valid quantum channel? It's easy to see that the answer is, this map is a valid quantum channel only if the initial process you used, this process C, was bistochastic. Of course, because you need your initial process to be bidirectional in order to be able to use it in a superposition of two directions. So this, this, this way of using a process can only be defined, even mathematically, it can only be defined if the process itself was bidirectional, was bistochastic. On top of that, if you want this transformation from a, a, f, that maps channel C into the new channel F of C, if you want this transformation to be a valid supermap, something that in principle you can do on the process without getting any contradiction with quantum theory, you need the time reversal to be equivalent to the transpose. You cannot just put the dagger. It needs to be the transpose. Why, again, if you want, we can talk about this in the end of the talk, which is soon. Uh, okay, so when this is the case, and when, only when this is the case, we call, this is a valid supermap, and we call it the quantum time flip. So the quantum time flip is this transformation that maps a process C into a process F of C 
where C is a bistochastic channel and F of C is defined by picking the, the transpose as the time reversal. All right, that's the definition. So now what are the key results? First key result is that the, the quantum time flip is genuinely an operation with indefinite time direction. So you cannot break it into a mixture of operations done in the forward way and operations done in the backward way. It's gen genuinely a pure quantum superposition. Of course, otherwise I would not be talking about it. Uh, the second thing is like, okay, how, how would it look if you wanted to realize it? Well, there is a simple quantum circuit that realizes the quantum, sweep, the, the quantum time flip using, uh, uh, using post-selection. So by preparing an entangled state, applying your blue process, the, uh, doing some control swap operation, and then post-selecting on some particular outcome of a measure, of a bell measurement. So if you do this, you can do it, you can simulate this situation with some probability. And in a more exotic world where post-selection can be done deterministically in some magic way, the, the quantum time flip could really be implemented in a deterministic way. Another thing that one could do is to simulate the quantum time flip with interferometry by using photons. You can route photons uh, with, with some crystals and make them enter either in one way or the other. And in principle, this allows you to simulate the, the quantum time flip and to do experiments on everything I've been saying. And this has been done by the group of BNU at the um, University of Science and Technology of China. Last thing about the quantum time flip is that it gives you an advantage in a game. You can try to play a game and see uh, how well you can, you can play the game using indefinite time direction. And here is the game. It's um, inspired by a similar game with, um, with, with a quantum switch, with the superposition of orders. And the idea is this. There is a referee, let's say me, who gives you two black boxes, uh, black, one uh, that implements some unitary gate U, and another that implements another unitary gate V. And these boxes have, um, uh, they are completely unknown to you. You don't know what is U and what is V, except that I promise to you that one and only one of these two properties will be satisfied. Either UV transpose is equal to U transpose V or UV transpose is equal to minus U transpose V. Now the game, is for you to discover which one of these two properties holds without knowing what are U and V in general. Um, so the result is this, very quickly. If you can, if you have access to this magic operation, to the quantum time flip, you can answer my question without any probability of error. Ideally, you can solve the, 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 the puzzle and answer exactly with probability one. If instead you are constrained to use these boxes in a fixed time direction, which is the same for both, let's say U and V in the forward direction, for example, then you will always lose uh, with the probability of it, well, you will lose with the probability of at least uh, 11%. So if we play this game all over, uh, over and over with different values of U and V, I can basically witness or detect whether you have access to indefinite, causal, uh, to indefinite time direction or not. Curiously, even if you are able to use U and V in a superposition of orders, still you would uh, make mistakes with 11% probability as long as you use the two devices always in the same time direction. All right, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, the conclusions are a summary of the points I made. I will skip the summary. I would mention just two future directions. One would be to make this um, uh, superposition of time directions uh, a bit more physical, see like, what would be a physical model, for example, in quantum gravity, where one would really see that, uh, other than models with post-selections that are easy. No? And the other would be somehow to, to reproduce the type of work that people have been doing with indefinite causal order. And now do this uh, with, uh, with, uh, with indefinite time direction. See if there is some game where you use only the classical inputs and the classical outputs in the game to witness uh, that you have indefinite time direction. That's uh, something very interesting, not as easy as it may seem. So these are kind of interesting, is interesting food for thought for future directions. So that's all. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Giulio. Let's uh, all uh, virtually uh, applause and uh, thank Giulio. Thank you. Uh, and
and um, this would open the stage for for questions so uh, if you want to ask a question you can directly uh, unmute yourself and uh, yeah i don't expect that we will get a chaos where too many people uh, speak so let's see hello hi andrea hi julio um good morning no, no, good afternoon and uh <laughs> thank you for your talk as usual really clear i'm still impressed by how few um how few axioms you need to characterize uh, the time the time reversal mm -hmm. um i I have, a, I have a question that it's kind of on the way to relating uh, your like the relation between your work and the work i did with carlo and and uh, piedro yes uh, because and it's something i wanted to ask you for a while um because i see you you define the time reversal like as a switch of perspectives so describing uh, the same process from two different perspectives yes and then but then and i understand that and but then when you do the when you define the supermaps so you actually it seems like you're thinking of using the same process no sorry you you're thinking of using two different processes but in a superposition of being that the original process and the process reversed yes is, is that is that my understanding this year? Can you switching from this passive point of view of time reversal where you're describing to different directions to an active one where you have like you actually create a new process in your position? Um, that's a very good question. There are very interesting things to say in the process of answering to it. So let me first give a conservative answer and then add the extra twists. Uh, so the, the conservative answer is that um, we're not really switching the perspective. So let me kind of restate the logic of what we are doing. So there is a, a device, this blue box that I had, and I know that in the forward direction, if I use it in the forward direction, the response of this device to my experiments will be given by a quantum channel C. Now the question is, uh, how would this de the same device respond if uh, I, I, I were uh, interrogating it in the opposite direction by acting in the future and, and preparing the, uh, and doing measurements in the past. And the answer is that um, the, the new channel that describes this alternative way of using the process is theta of C, right? So this is, you can still say that everything is completely passive. It's from the point of view of like the agent being in the future and using the process in the, in the opposite way. Yeah? Okay, now that we have these two ingredients, we can still think in a passive way and say, okay, what about if me, if I, as an agent, I am distributed in a weird superposition of being in the future, and, sorry, in being in the past and being in the future. So still from a passive point of view, how would the use of this device look to me if I were like half, like with, probably, with amplitude one over root two in the past and with amplitude one over root two in the future? So in this sense, um, we still don't, in principle, we still don't need any switch of perspective. Okay? So, so at least at the kind of logical level, we never really changed the perspective. That's the conservative answer. Now, uh, the, the, twi the extra twist to the plot is that, uh, however, if we want this, 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 this operation that we described to be a valid supermap, so something that I can do on the process, if I want this to be an action that I can implement on the, on the process, then I am forced to choose the time reversal to be the transpose, which is actually the only type of time reversal that also has, a, in principle, an active interpretation. So the interpretation of turning the process C into actively into a new process theta of C that I can put on the same table next to the, the original one and, and use it in, the, in this active way. So, so actually, this is a very good point that, uh, that we, we should actually highlight more in the paper. Um, so we could even define a, quantum, a sort of quantum time flip that is not a super map, but it is a sort of um, the passive operation that we could define. Uh, sorry, let me, let me think for a second. Oh yeah, no, no, one more thing that I want to say. So this is not only about, um, so the reason why when we define this time flip, uh, let me see if I can go back to the definition. 
That's an interesting technical point. I don't know what to make of it uh, conceptually yet. But, so the technical point is that you can define this channel with any type of uh, time reversal you like, the transfers or the dagger. Mm -hmm. And this channel is well defined as long, uh, whatever, uh, with whatever definition, as long as the input channel was be stochastic. However, if you want this channel F to be independent of the Krauss decomposition, of the choice of operators you use to represent the initial channel C, then you need to pick the transpose. So if you just want this to be defined as a function only of the, of the channel and not of the operators, if you want this technical requirement, then you are forced to pick the transpose and that the transpose is the only time reversal that is in principle compatible with an active interpretation. So eventually we tend to prefer the transpose, which happens to the one that has the active interpretation, is the one that would have this switch of perspective that you were saying. And somehow it is kind of brought in, in a sense, by mathematical nicety. It comes out in this way. And uh, it's kind of interesting to dig a little bit deeper into why this happens. Hmm. Uh, and how does this relate to the fact that we normally take the time reverse as the um, a joint of a unitary. So when we talk about unitaries, then we, we take the joints. That's adjoints another normally. very good question. Um, when I embarked into this work, so I also thought that uh, we should say we normally describe the time reversal as right. the inverse of a unitary. That's what we, I thought that's what we normally do. Um, and uh, it was kind of one thing that held us back from publishing these results, because we had these results ready, like, Two, three or four years even before we, we went into publication was that the time reversal we needed was the transpose and not the dagger. And this sounded weird. Why the transpose? Why, why, why this, like, why this non-standard choice? Then when I, after we put this out and we understood that actually if you look into the literature, in, in another type of literature, the one in thermodynamics and, and um, fluctuation dissipation theorem, it is actually the transpose that is the, is the canonical notion of time reversal. Although people don't say this in this way. I had an extra slide on this because I was expecting a type of discussion on this in the end. Oh, oops. Uh, sorry. I'm not sharing anymore, right? So I should go back to the sharing, um, sharing the slides. So in the, in the kind of canonical, in the old school way of describing time reversal and dating back to Wigner, you have the time reversal on states as a change of description for states where you do some anti-unitary operation because you need that for the canonical commutation relations to, to be preserved. If you do that and you, and you ask what is really the change that you have in a unitary evolution induced by this Wigner type of time reversal on the states, then you get back to the transpose. So if you take the old school definition of time reversal from Wigner, you get only the transpose and not the usual thing because the backward agent would presumably look at the state, see the states, not as just the same states that we see, but the, the kind of time reversal of them. So it would put uh, this anti-unitary operation, like do a complex conjugation everywhere, for example. Mm -hmm. I can talk more about this if, if people are interested. Um, if not, uh, we can just gloss over it. So yes, um, the kind of na one natural way of thinking of the time reversal, especially in quantum information, is to think of really the inverse, the, the dagger. But if you look into the kind of old school time reversal a la Wigner, and on the new school type of thing that people have been doing in thermodynamics and fluctuation dissipation theorem, changing the languages and doing the right translation, you will find that is only the transpose. So physically, actually, it seems that also the transpose is the, the, the transpose is also the privileged choice for reasons that are completely different from the one I showed in this talk. Okay. But there are, for oh, example, people yeah. who are obsessed about the fact that, that the Hamiltonian should be bounded from below, and they feel very bad that when you take the dagger, that taking the dagger would change a Hamiltonian that is bounded from below into one that is bounded from above, and that would sound like unphysical. And, uh, and they are very pleased that instead of doing the transpose would just map a Hamiltonian that is bounded from below into one that is bounded from below. So there are all these uh -huh. physical intuitions that also justify the transpose as the canonical choice. But if you just look at the four axioms we, we, we put, we have both. We have the dagger and the, the transpose together. 
so adding this adding a, like a, a last requirement where you say this this should be able to be implemented physically then you get the transpose only the transfer if you want if you from our point of view if you add axiom number C, uh, number five uh, to say that uh, you want to implement this supermap actively as an operation that can be done locally on a part on a big, of a big revolution, then you end up with only the transpose uh, uh, and not with the dagger because the dagger would be, give you negative probabilities. So it's not compatible with that active interpretation. Right. Either you do the dagger wow. everywhere in the universe or if you do it only locally, it gives you negative <laughs> probabilities. Okay, that's fascinating. Uh, Thank thanks. you. Thanks for the very deep and fruitful questions. I mean, there is there is a lot to think about more than about these questions, I believe. Sure. I, I guess I go next. Yeah. Uh, hi, I mean, you guys hi, decide Julio. the order. Uh, I'm not really doing select, keeping track of who asked first. So yeah, yeah, that, that's ah, please, the, 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 please just already self organize yeah. yourself. In, yeah. So, um, I mean, first, I apologize for missing the first half of your talk because of a confusion due to time zones. No problem. Um, now, my, my question is uh, maybe not uh, a little bit away from the main thrust of your talk. Yeah. Which is that, so, so if you can have such superpositions of indefinite causal order in an experimental system in the lab, in, do you think it, this, this tells us anything about whether or not such superpositions might happen at a more fundamental level? Well, such it depends as, very much on the experiment, the level. right? No, no, I mean, I mean, I mean like, uh, what I mean is that, you know, like we have an arrow of time. Yes. Right, like a cosmological yes. arrow of time. So let me talk about so, an experiment that has been done, that has really been done in a real lab. So there is a, uh, well, I have a picture, let me see here. I have the picture for that. So that's a schematic. So there is a crystal, like a polarization, a crystal that changes the polarization of a single photon that rotates it, applies some unitary rotation U of the polarization. Now what you do is to split a beam, to, well, to split a single photon on two paths. You send it on the blue path that enters into the crystal here from the top and comes out to the bottom or on the red path where you enter uh, from the bottom and go out to the top. So the time direction is in, in this experiment, in the, in the physical world outside is very well defined. You know? you can, even in my picture, you see at time t0, we are here, and then we split the photon, we go either here. But the, the superposition of two different paths reproduces the same mathematical process that you would get if you were in an exotic world where you could enter into this, into a physical process uh, from two different time directions, which is not what the experiment does, of course, right? So uh, the final product, if you look just from, 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 from the input system to the output system, if you don't care about what happens in between, from the beginning to the end, this would, would look exactly as uh, the result of the quantum time flip. So whatever protocol that we have using the quantum time flip can some, somehow be tested experimentally by doing this experiment. Now, of course, what the experiment is, is doing is not uh, to, to use the same physical process between two different moments of time in a superposition of like traveling forward in time and traveling backward in time. No, that's not what, what the photon is doing. Um, what we do is just we take advantage of the fact that the crystal is already a controlled device. The, the crystal is more than just a, a unitary gate that rotates the polarization. The crystal is already a controlled unitary gate that says that if you enter from the top, there is a unitary gate U. And if you enter from the bottom, you have a unitary gate that is equivalent to the transpose of U. That's your initial resource in the experiment. That's what, what the crystal, this piece of glass is doing for you is already giving you this naturally to you. Okay, so a different story would be to be physically in space time with some process that happens between T1 and T2 and being able to enter with a state from T1 and making measurements at T2 and vice versa, entering, being in a supervision with this, entering at T2 and, and doing the measurement at T1. 
That's a much more exotic way to get the same final result. So this parallels quite closely what happens with the quantum switch. There, is, there, is very, there are very exotic realizations of indefinite order when you have two boxes, box A and B. There could be very exotic realizations where these two boxes A and B happen in two patches of space-time that genuinely are connected in a superposition of orders. And there are optical experiments that are done by taking advantage that you can have a photon that goes either on this path where it encounters one piece of glass A before the piece of glass B or the other way around. So you can reproduce the same final effect of the, of the, of the quantum switch without really taking the original boxes and, and plugging them in a superposition of orders. So this is a similar situation. But uh, I mean, the experiments are valuable in both cases because somehow it allows you to have, uh, to see through an experiment that you can do, how things would be in a more exotic scenario that is where, where space-time has some quirky features. Now it's like, I don't know, there are tabletop experiments that simulate a black hole. So it doesn't mean that you have built a black hole in the lab. It means that uh, there is a isomorphism between one mathematics and the other. And, uh, one experiment in ex is an experiment you can do with the normal physics. The other one is an experiment you, co you could see in a very exotic world. Of course, the, the experiment you do is the normal one. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope this answers your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, some questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, may, may, I, have a, may I ask a question? Yes. Is this Pablo? Hi, Pablo. Hello, how's it going? Good. How so, uh, just uh, two, two technical questions first. Um, so, do you characterize the bi-stochastic bi as uh, also uh, pre preparing with uh, random uh, stuff instead of having a clean psi as an ancillary? That's a very good and very interesting technical question. Uh, the, the answer is no, actually, quite surprisingly. In, if, you, if you look in the quantum world, there is a difference between three types of processes. One type of process is the bistochastic ones, the ones that in principle can be used in both directions of time, according to our characterization. Um, another uh, type of process is the one you said, processes that uh, are obtained by letting the system interact with an environment with the unitary evolution of the system and the environment together and putting the environment in the maximally mixed state, like ident density matrix identity over D, where D is the dimension. So this class of processes is strictly smaller than the full set of bistochastic channels. So every channel you get by letting the system interact with an environment in the, in the maximally mixed state will be a bistochastic channel but uh, not all bistochastic channels can be obtained in this way. So this is something that was discovered in the literature on mathematical physics of quantum open systems. Uh, Counterexamples are pretty interesting. Um, some of them are more exotic than others. And there is another type of, 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 of processes that is even smaller than the ones you were saying. So random unitary processes. So imagine that um, your system evolves with some uh, unitary evolution, but you just don't know which one. So effectively, the, the quantum channel that describes the evolution of, of the system is just a randomization over many possible unitary evolutions. But like the evolution is truly unitary, but I don't know which one. So all these processes are bistochastic. They can all be realized in the way you said, by coupling the system with, uh, with, um, with an environment that is maximally mixed. But there, this set of random unitary processes is strictly smaller than the set of processes realized by coupling with an environment in a maximally mixed state. So there are three sets, random unitary. Uh, the, the, the ones you said are called the noisy, usually in quantum information, noisy operations and bistochastic. They are one included uh, within the other, and all the three inclusions are strict in quantum theory. Whereas in classical yeah. theory, these three definitions are exactly the same. So if you take, um, if, you if you have a, a, class a discrete classical system, uh, let's say a bit 
and you randomize uh, the, the identity and the big flip, let's say, or, or edit, and you do all possible permutations with some probability, these are all the possible big stochastic processes you can do. This is called the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. It says that the most big stochastic processes in classical theories are just randomizations of permutations of the states. Uh, famously, in quantum theory, this is not true. So the, there is no quantum Birkhoff theorem. This has been a problem that many people have been interested in. And the first result on this is by Streeter. It is an old result in mathematical physics. Very beautiful. There is a very simple channel that you can build, defined by Streeter, that is obviously bistochastic, but not, uh, uh, not random unitary. You can do it with angular momentum operators. You map the density matrix rho to Jx rho Jx plus uh, Jy rho Jy plus Jz rho Jz, where Jx, Y, and Z are the angular momentum operators. So you normalize this thing so that it maps uh, density matrices into density matrices. And if your spin, if your particle with angular momentum has spin larger than one half, this is a bistochastic channel, but is not, uh, you cannot decompose it into a random unitary channel. So as simple, the example is very simple. And this is just bistochastic, but not random unitary. And now I don't remember if there is a way to decompose this in the way you said, as a, as a kind of noisy operation. But I suspect that the answer may be no, even for that decomposition. I mean, maybe okay. this, this example is already a counterexample, but I'm not sure on the second part. But definitely it was a counterexample to the conjecture that random unitary is the same as bistochastic. So they're not. Right, uh, another technical question. You ask your legitimate um, supermaps to go from bistochastic to usual channels. Yes. Uh, is it because you don't need to ask that they go to bistochastic themselves? Um, well, because we have done only one thing, we could have done it also from bistochastic to bistochastic. Um, there, is a, there, there would be a motivation for doing that. As you have noticed, in the specific example we considered, the particular supermap we define, this quantum time flip, is also mapping bistochastic into bistochastic. So, so that would be fine, even if we had this more restrictive de definition. Uh, both definitions are fine. Uh, if, if we really work harder on this problem, they would, do, would have slightly different interpretations. No? Uh, from the point of view of the agent, you can map a bistochastic channel. It's like the, the process you get into an ordinary channel because everything is from the point of view of the agent. So the agent can do ordinary channels in principle. That's the effective description of the agent. If you think at the fundamental level, if you really believe that at the fundamental level, the only processes that should be allowed are either unitary processes or bistochastic ones, if you think that way, then it makes sense to consider supermaps from bistochastic to bistochastic, because this would say like, in a more objective way, what you can do on the processes that you find in physics and transform them into other processes that you can find naturally in physics. So this would be the slightly different interpretation that you have in the two cases. Okay. So if I'm allowed, uh, just a last uh, more philosophical question. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be the problem in saying precisely that, that uh, bistochastic maps are the only thing we, we have and is allowed in physics? So of course, uh, you would say, well, but no, we are allowed to prepare um, definitive, uh, definite initial states. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. Maybe we only do that with a certain probability and then we repeat this over and over until we get an initial mm -hmm. state. So maybe that's where the asymmetry lies in the fact that uh, to prepare an initial state, you mm -hmm. can do repetitions. To prepare a final state, then, that, then it's costly to do repetitions. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, that's a, an extremely good point to make. Um, as I was mentioning it before, one, there were basically two reasons why we have been held back in making these results public. One was this thing of the weird transpose, and the other was this point, like, uh, who cares about the supermaps on these stochastic channels? Like, what is <laughs> so special about the stochastic channels? It's not the physics as we know it, as it's like, it's like that. But I came to somehow converge to this second philosophic point of view, is the one that, that you mentioned, that. Uh, Maybe at the fundamental level, it really makes sense to say that um, 
the processes that are out there are the bistochastic ones. This is a non-trivial statement in physics, so it may be wrong, may, may be true or maybe not true. So that's an extra step compared to our result. But I'm saying that one may want to this extra step and say, because um, what is our real experience about doing things in the lab? When we say that we prepare a pure state or, or a state that is not maximally mixed, what is the thing that we are really doing? Or I don't know, if you look at the sun, you say the sun is in a thermal state, it's not in the, in the maximally mixed state. What does it mean that the system is a thermal state? So, for example, in experiments that we do, uh, most often when we say I prepare a pure state, we do it, um, well, either by post-selection, like a stern gerlach -like experiment, we just, we could have the spin up or down and we just see that it's up and from that moment on, we act as if we prepared a pure state. So we just filtered the states where we had, the case where we had a pure state and we discarded the rest. So we do a sort of post-selection. Or we do processes like, uh, like thermalization processes or processes where, or cooling processes where you turn down the temperature and the system becomes purer and purer. So I say like, isn't this a, a way to deterministically prepare a pure state? So that was one thing that held me back for a long time. So like, who cares about these stochastic processes if my experience of physics is that I can really turn down the temperature and prepare a pure state. So the real world is not a world of bistochastic processes, but is a world of pure states and unitary interactions, namely all possible processes. Now, the point is that if you look a bit deep, more deeply in what, I, what does it mean to turn down the temperature, it means that you make your initial system interact with the reservoir of other systems that are purer than the one you had. So basically this cooling is mostly like swapping some purity from the reservoir you had into the, into the system you are cooling. So if you look at the very fundamental level, you could ask the question, so where, where does this reservoir come from? How do you even know that, uh, that you have a, a, a reservoir at a, at a lower temperature? For, uh, and basically to have that uh, operationally, I think in the end, somehow it would mean having been able to filter systems uh, uh, that are purer than the original ones. So I think, of course, there is a lot of theoretical work to be, to be done here to show that this interpretation is a physically, a physically attainable interpretation. You cannot just say it. There is work to be done technically to show that all this is consistent. But my intuition, my physical intuition, that if you do all the work, eventually this interpretation is A, tenable, so a, it would be a good one, and B, it makes a lot of sense in the end, because you could, then you would think that this abilities, the thermodynamics becomes a sort of a, well, this is not something new. This, this thing that people have said for some, some parts of thermodynamics at least can be seen as a resource theory of purity if not the whole of thermodynamics, at least some tiny part of thermodynamics can be seen as a resource theory of having reservoirs that are purer or, or input states that are purer than the one, than the maximally mixed one. And in a sense, this story of um, post-selection and getting things out of the mixed state gives you a clear physical explanation of why purity is a resource, no? Because getting pure states costs you time, no? You have to, 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 to post-select them. You have to redo experiments and, 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 and have a memory that allows you to keep track of what was the state of these systems. So there is an actual effort that the experimentalist has to do to build the reservoir from scratch, if one wants to build the reservoir from scratch. So this resource theory of purity would somehow physically be well motivated if you really think that at the fundamental level you only get access to be stochastic processes and to maximally and to random preparations of ensembles or ensembles of the of the maximally mixed state. But it's important to stress, as I said, that there is technical work to be done there that is not being done yet, and we don't really claim that the word works in that way. We don't claim that at the fundamental level you have only these stochastic processes, but we say that, uh, well, we do part of the work to say that if you want to classify the processes that are bidirectional according to the four axioms, then you really end up only with the bistochastic ones. So then everybody is free to, 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 to make the conclusions that they want. We have done our part of the work. The interpretation is, is the next part, and, and a lot of it is still open. Thank you so much. 
Thanks. Hi, Julio. I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. I would like to go back to the difference between the transpose and the dagger mm -hmm. to, to do the time reversal. And I was yeah. thinking that in, in particle physics, we also have two operations to do the time reversal. There is the T operation, which is just time reversal in the sense yeah. of I change the coordinate from T to minus T. Mm -hmm. And there's also the CPT uh, yes. operation yes. Of where there's also parity and conjugation. Yeah. And well, we know that's the the operation for which the laws of physics are yes. uh, symmetrical. And, and I was wondering if these there was an analogy between you think there is an analogy between this thing in particle physics and the transpose and mm -hmm. absolutely. That's a very 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 good point. Is again, it allows me to highlight things that I didn't really say in the talk. Well, actually, this one is not even in the paper, but uh, it's kind of obvious if you look at what we do. So if you look at our four axioms, then they are not really about time reversal in the particle physics sense. They're not really about specifically about T. They're about every order reversing pros, pros, procedure you could apply. So it applies to T, uh, to, to PT, to CT, CPT, everything. Thing that reverses the order would satisfy these four axioms. It doesn't have to be just the mapping of, of t into minus t. So, out of these four axioms that I had before, and if you want, I can go back to them. You can read them again and see that they would still apply mm -hmm. to the other notions. So, uh, so what I called the time reversal was called the time reversal a little bit because we wanted to, to make the intuition in more immediate. But the right word for this there should be order reversal. So what we classified are the possible order reversal transformations. Not necessarily the time reversal in the strict sense of particle physics. So we get the all possible order reversing operations, the possible changes of point of view for all these possible order reversing symmetries would be either the transpose of, of the dynamics or the, the dagger. And uh, now we can play the game of matching <laughs> which one of the physical operations you described or the physical symmetries you described correspond to a transpose and which one corresponds to a dagger. Uh, so I believe, uh, I mean, the one I'm most familiar with is the time reversal in the sense of Wigner. So if you say my time reversal symmetry should be basically an anti-unitary operation, a fixed anti-unitary operation. This is the transpose. This is the transpose. Now, if you, if you add, let's say, an anti-unitary operation with the, with the change, uh, for example, of, um, I think this would be a parity operation, just changing from, from, a, uh, from, a, from three Cartesian axes uh, where, where you have a, like, right-handed Cartesian axis to left-handed Cartesian axis. If I understand correctly, this also would be a kind of another anti-unitary operation. And I, if, if my memories from undergraduate physics are correct, this would also uh, be an anti-unitary. So the result, the composition of a T and the P together would be a, a unitary uh, operation at the level of states. And this would be the dagger at the level of um, at the level of evolution. Uh, I'm not 100% uh, sure about this, so please bear with me if I made a mistake here. But what our theorem says is that uh, basically all this possible order reversing symmetry would correspond either to the transpose or to the dagger of the time evolution of the, of the, of the propagator from one time to the other. And uh, it's kind of an interesting exercise that has yet to be done to exactly match which physical symmetry maps to the transpose and which physical symmetry maps to the, to the dagger. Uh, one time I gave a, a version of this talk and there was um, a friend of mine, Michael Scottignotis, who pointed out a paper by himself, Barry Sanders and maybe others, 
where they were discussing the difference between CPT and, and maybe just T or just, I don't remember which one. And they were making the point that in one case, uh, you get uh, the, the dagger and in the other you don't. Um, so there was a story about that. And I'm sorry, I cannot remember exactly what the result was. But I think there is a point in just going back to these questions and now mapping the, the canonical symmetries of particle physics to the two cases of the theorem that we have proven. And I am, and I'm hundred percent sure that there will be a, like an exact mapping, and you always fall it into these two cases, dagger or transpose. Okay, thanks. Thanks. It's clear. Okay, that was a number of good questions. Um, are there any further questions <clears throat> from the audience? Okay, um, I would then say that we stop the recording. Let's see. <laughs>